am Frank. Welcome to HB Insight Series, where we enter the minds of artists. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our HB Insight Series. I'm Francesca Ferrara. And I'm Jesse Hernandez. And this is our new HB podcast, which we are starting. It's our first episode. And we wanted to have a communication tool with our students where they could learn more about our teaching artists and our alumni. And um, as Jesse was saying before, uh, ask things that and learn about things that they might not have time to learn about in their classes. That's right, because sometimes we are in the classroom and time goes by so quickly and we're focused on technique and the scenes and everything we're doing. And then who do we vent with? here at HB Studio Podcast. <laughs> and today we have a very special guest. It's Ben Meltz that's joining us. Yay! <laughs> Welcome, Ben. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. I was just I was just in rehearsal with the core students right now, and now I'm here. That's beautiful. I love a busy agenda. <laughs> yes. And how's the going? How's the show going? It's good. We're, we're blocking and the students are coming in with a lot of great stuff and it's, yeah, it's fun being in the room. It's feeling good. Excellent. And then at the end of the podcast, we can learn where we can see that and the dates and, and on all oh, that. Oh yes, yeah. that's going to be lovely. I love that. But let's just jump into business. There's something that I'm really curious to know always, every time I meet an actor and it's why did you became an actor? Oh, you know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when that started, but I know that ever since I can remember, my parents were always saying to me like, oh, you're such a performer. And I, I don't know, I remember like playing tricks on my friends. Like I would like to try to kind of convince them of things <laughs> that weren't true, that they were actually true. I was like kind of mischievous that way. Um, and then I had an opportunity to go to an art school from the fifth grade onward. And it just, I caught the bug big time there. And it was wow. something that I was just never willing to let go of as I moved forward. And so your imagination was strong from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. And that's wonderful when you also support your children, you know, to find their own identity and pursue their dreams because many parents hear that their kid wants to be an actor and it's like, oh no, <laughs> yeah. what did I do? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's so competitive. I think parents get protective and they try, a lot of parents say, oh, you should have a backup plan or, and then it, it kind of can go that route. And that's distracting for but, uh, artists yeah. to feel that they have to have that. But. And it's a hard business. It's hard to make it as an actor. Mm -hmm. And that's also part of the journey. And um, I'm for really sure. curious to know, and after you graduated, what was your first acting job ever? What was the first thing you did? Well, the first, I mean, my first real taste of acting outside of a school setting was when I was still in undergrad and I did Equus at a, in a wow. community theater. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was a big, it was a big challenge, but I was so, I was so ready for it. And I, I remember I almost didn't do it because I thought I wouldn't have enough time. Um, but I, I learned, it actually energized me so much that I felt like I was able to do even more while I was doing that show than if I hadn't done it. Yeah. And I remember something that really stuck with me from that was my oldest brother was like, he, it was the first time he'd ever seen me do that. And he was, he was like genuinely blown away. And that, that really propelled me that I was like, oh, this is wow. real. This I'm is good. maybe something I can do. <laughs> yeah. And how old were you exactly when that was that? I, Were that you? must have been, oh, you know what? That, no, sorry. That wasn't in undergrad. That was, I was still in high school. I was 17 oh when I did that. Wow. wow. Now I feel bad about myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's an intense play. And yes, it is. Yeah. That's insane. Man, that's it, crazy. it is a really intense play. And uh, when you do a play like that, especially it was like me coming out and discovering myself and being out on my own in front of this audience and with new people and discovering myself in a big way which was also true for the character, which helped. Um, yeah. At that time in your life, did you have, other than your parents, who I'm sure we'll talk about, um, who were your teachers? Like, was there a, the, the, the director of that play? Were they real mentors to you? Or who were your, your major mentors at that age? 
I think I was really lucky. I had from the sixth grade on, I had a teacher, Paul Como, who he he was so passionate about this work, about theater um, and and film. He wanted to expose his students to great film. He started a film club and he was my drama teacher in school. And I remember I invited him, him and no Marcus. He was my mime teacher. I got to have a mime class when I went wow. to this, <laughs> there was this school in Toronto where I'm from called Claude Watson School for the Arts. And I remember I invited them both to my bar mitzvah because they were very important teachers to me. Yeah. And I'm still in touch with them to this day. Wow. Um, yeah. Paul Como was at my wedding too. It was so that those early, yeah. those early mentors, they, they mean a lot. Yeah. And it's amazing how a teacher can shape your life forever. Like I've had, you know, fellow actor friends that have, have had experiences like yours that, you know, had a wonderful teacher or people that truly can, you know, be brought down by somebody saying like, you're not going to make it or it's so hard in this business. Yes. And so it's so important to, you know, know who we listen to and choose our teachers carefully too. And talking about teaching, how did you become a teacher then? <laughs> well, I, I feel like I've been really lucky to have a lot of amazing teachers along the way. And when I was in undergrad and then I chose to go to grad school afterwards and I went to NYU for that. And I had remarkable teachers who I, again, had this experience of like discovering myself and coming out in in new and surprising ways. And this was all fostered by, by my teachers. And so my decision to teach myself really came from a pursuit and a, a looking for how I can stay engaged and involved in this thing that I love, this craft that I love so much, when it's not a consistent thing that's happening because you get a gig, yes. you get a job yeah. and then you wait and you don't know when the next one is going to come. It's horrible. And it's, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging lifestyle to live. Um, and so I was searching, I found myself searching like, okay, how can I fill myself and how can I make money? Maybe I can combine those things in, into one. And I, I realized that I would love to pass forward the things that have meant so much to me yeah. as from when I was a student. And so I did, I found teaching. I, I started to put feelers out and say, okay, well, I guess they're looking for someone to teach the summer program. Maybe I can give it a try. Maybe I can see how that goes. And, and I, would, I kept looking for more and it kind of evolved naturally that way. Wow. Where was that? Where was the where was the first place you ever taught? The first place I ever taught was at the public theater in their. Um, oh, not too God. shabby. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a, it was called a Midsummer Days Camp. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> or a I wish I was camp. in that camp. Yeah, that was probably I want to so sign fun. up. <laughs> <laughs> and they were they were like young. They were uh, I think it was around they were around 13, 14 that age, um, or like just starting high school. And yeah, it was like a two week intensive where I like brought everything that I had learned in grad school to these, to these young, young students. Oh, they're so lucky. Yeah. That's so good. And was it, was that a good experience? Were they pretty open or did you have to pry them open or were oh, they? It was, it was great. They were so game. We, I mean, we played a lot of games yeah. and it was just, you know, meeting them where they are. And we were doing, yeah. they were doing Shakespeare scenes and they were invested in it. They all really wanted to be there. So it was, it was very fun. Yeah. I mean, that's usually my experience, honestly, teaching, acting. It's, you've got a bunch of people who really want to be there, yes. <laughs> yes. which is great. Yeah. And it's amazing when you're younger, I feel that you're more open and willing to be more vulnerable. And the more we grow up, sometimes we be, you know, we become more like maybe scared. Oh yeah. And self-conscious. Yeah, self I think later ourselves, teens so. and, and it depends, you know, the, the environment that you grow up in, but definitely yeah. the world can start shutting you down <laughs> sometimes <laughs> not to sound too, but that's so important. too dramatic, but if you know what you want to do in life to start in a younger age, because then you can, you know, be like Ben and have all these mentors in your life and, you know, like have a clearer path of where you want to go to. 
Yeah, and um, more fearless, I think. Yes. It's like kids, when they start young skiing, it's like they're fearless. They'll just fly down the hill mm-hmm. and they don't think about it. So I think um, being on stage is similar. Yeah. yeah, and it's so important. And what do you want to bring in the classroom as a teacher? What's important to you? I mean, the I think one of the fundamental things that I want to bring to any class that I'm teaching is a sense of play and a sense of abandon so that students yeah. feel like they can try things out and risk failing um, and have have fun rather than what I think we get we get trained to think in terms of getting something right and getting the right answer and doing a good job and to like really unburden yourself of that and to just play to remember what it's like to play. And yeah, young people still remember how to do that a lot better than <laughs> some adults. Yeah. And so you kind of have to unlearn how you've been socialized in in this training and remember how to just play. Because that's what we that's what we ultimately have to do. We gotta play with each other. We're players. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what I, Peter Francis James says that in class quite often. He said, you know, we can try 12 things in the time that we can talk about one. Yes. So just get up there and try it, right? Like you just keep trying different things and play. It's and exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ideas are a dime a dozen. You're yeah. going you're, you're gonna to have tons of different ideas, but actually doing it, doing something and trying things out in space. That's you, you got you to gotta take a risk there and just go for it. That's incredible. And um, I would like to talk about something that I know it's um, it's a very sensitive um, subject and it's something that also makes you unique and wonderful as an actor. Um, when did you start noticing that, you know, you were maybe losing your sight? How did that begin with you? How did that begin? Yeah, um, it happened... I first noticed that I was n- having some vision loss it, in my last, the, the summer before my last year of my undergrad program. Um, I just noticed that I had like, these spots in front of my eyes that weren't going away. And I was like, what, what is that? And I was doing a show, I was actually doing Reefer Madness the musical at that time, and I was. I remember talking to the uh, the dramaturg about it and like opening up about about it to him and being concerned about like I don't know what what this is. Uh, anyway, I I went through that show um, without giving it too much thought, and then eventually I w- I saw a doctor about it, and I was diagnosed with a rare condition called Stargardt's disease, and it's a form of macular degeneration that's genetic. So both of my parents had the recessive gene and I got both of those genes. And then it comes out at different stages for different people, but usually early in life. Mm -hmm. Um, And for for me around 21, it was a little bit late compared to others. But yeah, I I went through that last year of, of undergrad learning how to adapt because I was having more and more difficulty reading and it was certainly interfering with my ability to read scripts and read uh, textbooks at the time. Um, And it was, yeah, it was very scary. And then when I I graduated, I I was still, I was doing this, this summer stock uh, touring Shakespeare. I was with this company in Toronto called Driftwood and I I worked That's a great with, name. <laughs> it, it's, they're amazing. They always have a cast of 10 that puts on Shakespeare plays and they go to different places around, around the city to places that are, don't necessarily get theater all the time. And we set up a stage and we perform outdoors. Um, and that was the first time where I was figuring out that I need to actually get larger print on my script in order to read the script and not have it like right up in my face. And so I was starting to learn to adapt and figure out how to do it. Um, but it was, it was confusing and I didn't know I was struggling with it. The, things don't always go linearly. It's not one step to the next. Yeah. I was unsure about what this meant for me and whether I could even continue to pursue this, whether it made any sense. Would I be able to read my scripts? Would I be able to respond to what I'm getting from my scene partner? Yeah. 
I didn't know what it would mean for me. And so there were a couple of years that I took for myself to, I was still doing things here and there, but there was a great deal of uncertainty about where my future was headed. And then I came to a point, I remember I cried. I, I remember one night where I just wept the most that I have ever wept in my life in oh my mom's God. arms. Wow. And it was after that that I just made a choice and I made a decision that I was not going to let this determine the rest of my life. And yes. I was not going to let it define yeah. me. And I was going to learn, I was going to double down on this choice to be an actor and to pursue that and learn what it means to be an actor with this particular disability. And so that's when I decided to audition for schools in the U.S. And I auditioned for a few schools, Juilliard, NYU. I got into both of them. Oh, my and God. I chose to go to NYU. <laughs> wow. And it was, and the, my main reason for being there was to figure out, okay, what does it mean for me to, how do I do, act with this? How do I bring this with me and continue to pursue this? That's incredible. And can I, I'm just very curious, what did you find in that search? Because it's certainly um, important to, you know, use our like five senses in in the way we act in, in everything, in, in the classroom, in, in our jobs. What did you learn? What other abilities did you gain over this? A couple things stand out in particular. I remember even when in the audition, Uh, Janet Zarish, who the wife of Mark Blum, who, um, oh, um, she in the audition, I, she asked me about about my my disease, and I t- told her about it, and she, her response was that she thought that it actually connects me more deeply to my own humanity, wow. the human condition. Wow. That's and beautiful. I had never <laughs> thought about it in that way before, but it was incredibly empowering to to think of it that way because, of course, loss is so is is human. It's what it is to be human. Yeah. We experience loss in various forms. Um, so, and then the other another moment that stands out to me is I was I was doing a scene. Um, Uh, translations by Brian Friel mm. and there was a scene where me and my scene partner are on opposite ends of the stage and I was being directed by my teacher Richard Feldman and I, it was like my, one of my greatest fears I mentioned uh, that like how will I be able to see my yeah. scene partner and respond appropriately to what I'm getting and it's this scene where they're not understanding what the other person is saying because they're speaking different languages so right. everything is based off of what you're getting from just experiencing the other person and seeing the other person and understanding the language underneath the language. Yeah. And I, again, I just started to cry because it was my mm-hmm. biggest fear coming to confront me. And I said, I don't know how to do this. I can't see her. I can't see her face. Yeah. I can't do it. And he said, you have to just trust what you can see what you can experience in this. It's enough. What you can sense, what you, what you can see, what you can sense is enough. And trust that. It's not, don't worry about what you think you should be able to see. Everyone sees differently. Wow. Everyone has different blind spots. And from that point on, I have trusted that. And I just what my experience is, is my experience. And I can, I can trust that. It doesn't need to be something else. It doesn't need to be something more. That's, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I'm literally <laughs> crying. <laughs> what beautiful gifts, both Janet it's, and who was the, the other? Richard teacher, Feldman. That just angels, that angels coming to tell you, this is, you made the right choice doubling down. Yeah. You can do this. Yeah. And the most important thing are always invisible to the eye and I can relate so much to you because and, and that's why I said before like how important it is to have supportive teachers because well you, you can tell English is not my first language and um, I feel that as a disability because I I took a, an accent reduction class and I had a teacher saying that if you don't get rid of your accent you're never gonna work yeah. ever 
And then I had an amazing teacher at HV Studio. Uh, this is not advertising, it's totally real. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, that's not an impairment for you. This is who you are. That's your identity. And it's beautiful. And you should embrace it. And that made me cry so much because I feel that we all have like a disability to call it some somehow like you know, to give it a word, we have, we always have something that we feel so self-conscious of or so uncomfortable yeah. and we bring it. And sometimes we feel that something that it's holding us back, but that's actually something that is pushing us forward. And I feel that happened to you, Ben. And it's amazing. We see your career, everything you've done. And I'm like, this guy is incredible. And that's, it's so important to have representation in the business. Yeah. We need to see actors we can relate to because we're always looking at this perfect figures or what we think is perfect. Right. And we need to know that there are human beings out there, you know, and to create more opportunities. And um, I would like to know from your point of view, what's something that can be done in the business to get more opportunities for people with disabilities, for people that are in a wheelchair, for people that are deaf. I saw a show and I was telling um, Francesca, Uh, before I went to see um, that play, uh, When the Rainbow is Enough. For Colored, for Girls, Colored Girls, yeah. yeah. And there was a, one of the actresses was deaf and she was my absolutely favorite. She was so connected and so present. And it, her presence was just so powerful to see. And it made me cry because for me, it's so important to see representation out there. So in in your experience, what can we do as a business to you know, be more inclusive. I think it, that we just, we need to speak up. We need to make ourselves heard. I think that when, when, whatever the challenge is, and I'm so glad that you related to this in terms of your accent, that it's, it's something that, you know, we all, the things that make us us are not things to be ashamed of or, or hide or try to work around, but to actually be more, be more yourself in this. Yeah. I think we limit ourselves. Everyone sort of limits themselves. Yeah. And puts, them, puts ourselves in these boxes sometimes. Yeah. I, in fact, it's, I also, I did have a teacher and I won't name him because it's not flattering. Um, but it was when I was first, first discovering this, con this condition, the star guards and figuring out what to do with it. I took an acting class in Toronto and, and he, I, stayed after class and I was very vulnerable. It was very new to me. And I broached the subject with him and I said, listen, I'm, I've got this thing that I'm dealing with and I'm not sure what to do about it. And I talked, I explained it to him, what, what I see and what I can't see. And his response was, he said, be careful who you tell that to. <gasps> oh my gosh. Yeah. And wow. I, I heard that and I kind of, I was yeah. like, oh, so that's, so this is something then that I have to hide. Oh, I have wow. to pretend oh that I, that I can see more than I can actually see. I have to learn how to fake this. And I, I, it was pretty fast that, that just my, my own body kind of rejected that because <laughs> I, like, I can't, well, good for I you. was like, yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. I can't fake that. And that could be terrifying for a young person when an adult is telling you, you have to hide yourself. Yes. Yes. It's yes. a horrible it, message I, to tell somebody. Well, I agree. And I also understand, you know, we were talking about parents and like the best of intentions. I think he did have the best of intentions. I think that it was coming from a place of fear for him looking out for me, yeah. thinking that he was looking out for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so my, my response to somebody coming to me with something like that would be the exact opposite yes. of just, you, you got to embrace yourself fully and bring your full self to your work. Yeah. Um, but so in terms of uh, advocacy for representation, it's, I think that we have, we often do feel like we have to hide or conform And I think the more out loud we can be with ourselves, the better. And yeah, advocate for, for what you think the things should look like. Yes. The, yeah. That's beautiful, Ben. You're like, I'm, I'm going to be crying the whole podcast. Yeah. I saw it. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> It's so 
so beautiful. And um, we want to talk about uh, something that happened recently in your career that <laughs> Francesca and I are a little obsessed about, and it's that serious, you. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen for you? Like getting that series that it's so popular right now. We're all so obsessed with it. How was that experience? That speaking of advocacy. So I'm going to be completely honest about the journey towards this to landing this. You never know. You just never know where this stuff is going to come from because I had so my wife had a friend from her childhood who has a friend <laughs> who also has star guards. And I oh, met wow. him oh, when wow. I was doing a show at Berkeley Rep. We got, he lives in San Francisco and we got together and spent the day together and just, you know, connected and ex shared our, whatever our shared experiences were with about having star guards. And we completely clicked and we became friends. And he had another friend who is an actress and he let me know that she was coming to New York, that she lives in the Bay Area and she was coming to New York and I should meet her. She's also visually impaired. And so we got coffee together and her name is Marilee Talkington and she's an actress. She's been in a few shows that you might yeah. recognize her if you saw her. And she is an advocate. She is a artist warrior, I think is her uh, Instagram. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Um, And my name came indirectly to the casting directors of you through, through her. I still don't fully understand how somewhere along the line somebody was looking to cast, rep being with representation in mind, cast somebody who was blind or visually impaired yeah. to play this character who is a blind librarian in the show. And among the names of actors who fit that, my name came up on that list because, because I had met Destiny. this person. Wow. Destiny. Destiny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so from there, I auditioned for it. And I, a friend of mine from school, I got together with her and she read for me and put me on tape, which is you, you need your community to yes. do yes. this. <laughs> yes. You really Absolutely. do. You, no one can do this alone. Yeah. Um, And and they liked what they saw, and they asked to see my reel, and 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 then I was I was when I got the call to say that I got that role, I was bathing my my very young twin daughters, <laughs> and I got the call from my agent, and he told me you booked it, and I was like, oh my I gosh. can't <laughs> talk to you right now. I'm bathing my daughters. I'll call you back later. Uh, but yeah. So that's that's so exciting. I'm that's crying a, again. That's amazing oh, that connections. <laughs> Just by saying yes to coffee, you yes. know that the, the art world is so small. <laughs> yes, you can meet someone on the other side of the country, and then they continue in your life, connecting you to other people. And then years things later, like this happen. Years later. Yeah. Oh wow! And it yeah. was years later. That's incredible. That's yeah. awesome. And um, I know you uh, you play a, a fully blind person in you. How did you prepare for that role? So I, I did a lot of research. I talked to a lot of people and I watched videos of people who are, who are completely blind and learned about how people talk about that and how they navigate the world. Um, and they also, I trained with an orientation and mobility specialist who's the person that teaches someone how to use a cane wow. uh, yeah. to navigate. And so I learned how, the, how that works, how I would actually get around the world, how I would negotiate stairs, how I would find doors. Um, and then I, I spent a lot of time just in my own, I have, like, I have a little courtyard behind my building that I, can, that I went there <laughs> after my kids would go to sleep and with my cane and just practice a lot, I would blindfold myself and move around with my cane to get in my body what it actually feels like to see the world with the cane without seeing, without using my eyes, but yeah. to feel. And it's interesting because it, it makes everything closer to you. You're, you have, you're more aware of what's immediately around you and you use your ears to hear what's further around you. Um, And then when I was actually in L.A. before I was shooting, 
I I walked up and down the streets with my cane wow. and just had the soft focus with my eyes. And I can I because I have a literal blind spot in the center of my vision, yeah. which I usually try to ignore and focus on what I can see. I just flipped that and just allowed myself to see my blind spot while I'm moving around and felt I felt like if I could do this with people on the street seeing me, then I could do it in front of the camera. Oh my God. That's fascinating. That's so, so powerful. diligent. And, uh, um, and so you know, brave. Yeah. Doing that, I, I wouldn't dare to do that in my own bedroom. Imagine yeah. like he's walking around <laughs> LA like that. That's wow. That You're so brave, man. And I'm so fascinated by your story. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, we were also like, um, I said before, I think off the mic, we were stalking you because we're like your stalkers <laughs> now. <laughs> and we're so obsessed with your work. It was beautiful. Um, we read a few things um, that you said in, in interviews and we found them fascinating. I'm going to tell my, my favorite one that it was, don't base your self-worth on your success in the industry. You have control over the work you put into your auditions, but not, but not the results. And that reminded me of a video on TikTok that I'm, I'm not obsessed with TikTok or anything. It's not <laughs> from my generation. Um, but uh, my friends, um, sent me this video of, I think it was a choreographer that said, remember when you walk into an audition room, you have something to share, not something to prove. And I was mm. like, Wow. Yeah. I thought that was so powerful because we're always like so self-conscious. We're trying to get that job. We're trying to get seen by these casting directors to prove I'm worth it. I'm good. I'm, I'm going to work hard. This yeah. is what I can do. Instead of just walking in with an open heart and open mind saying, I had fun. I prepared this for you. I'm going to share it with you. And it puts you in a powerful position. Like it shifts completely the situation. So I... I thought your quote was so powerful, but how do you get there? <laughs> it's beautiful, but I don't know how to apply that to my own life because when you don't get a job, like in my case, I start, well, I cry or I'm a crier and I start thinking about all the things I did wrong or something that I could have said better, or maybe I was too intense or maybe I didn't, I wasn't enough. Yeah. And you start critiquing your yes, own self. Yeah. And it's, it's horrible. So I, I'm so inspired by your life, your work, everything you've done. And I want to know how do you get to that point? Oh, it's a continuous process. I think it's, I, I, I don't want to frame it in terms of that I've come to a place where I've, I've arrived and I can just do this because I'm also deeply affected by rejections. Um, but I do try to, I, it's a, I do try to remind myself of this. This is like, because I think with experience, you, you just, you learn that it's, you're going to face a lot of rejection, a lot of rejection. And I think it's important for everyone to have that expectation going into it so that when it happens, it's not like, uh oh, there's something wrong with me. Uh, this isn't working out because it's actually, that is the norm. There is, that, that is what's to be expected. And I mean, I think it is just that you're, I love that, that quote, that you're going in there to share something, not to prove something. That's uh, huge, yeah. You, you do, you put the work into it and you, I mean, you do it because you love it. And so it's, yeah. it's coming from your own, <laughs> your own joy getting to do this work. Um, and you kind of want to do it for yourself, like invest, investigate whatever you've got from the sides, investigate who this character is, have your fun with it, engage in this thing that you love doing, and then share that and put that out there. And, and then you let it go because that's all, that's all there is. You can't, if you start to obsess over like, oh, if I had just done this, you just never know. You can't. I think it's so important to go in and do what you want to do with the material and let let people see what you bring to it rather than going in t and trying to like do what you think they want to see. That's so yeah. powerful. Yeah. Because yes. you'll never know what they want. And, and we're there's no to, way to we're know. We're trying to please and guess what they want to see instead of focusing on what we want to bring to the table. That's oh, I'm quoting you. I'm writing this for my own personal uh, <laughs> material <laughs> when I read every morning to feel good. 
<laughs> yeah, and no, I I also, another th- way that I think about it is I get these, this is an opportunity for me to have some exposure anytime you have an audition. Yeah. It's not a, actually, I don't think about it as getting that job. I mean, sometimes I really do want to get that job, but what I'm, it is still an opportunity for people to see you do your work. Yeah. So you just, it's a performance. You go in and you do your work and people, you, you get to have some important people see it. <laughs> yeah, because the casting directors will call you again. Exactly. It's about just, yeah, letting them see what, what you can do. Exactly. Yeah. And I've spoken with casting directors who say exactly that. They're, they see the same person five times and they, they feel like, oh, I hope they don't think that we hate them. We love them. Mm-hmm. It's just it right. hasn't been right for whatever reason so far. But they want to see you again. Yeah. If you keep showing, showing yeah, and they're clearly for looking it. for that person. They're looking for the right thing for that yeah. person because they keep calling them in. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to remember. Mm-hmm. They need us <laughs> just as much as we need them. Like, yes, right. That's Casting right. directors, they need the good actors. They need you to be coming in and doing great work. That's yeah. right. It makes their job easier. We yeah. forget that. And it's hard also to be a casting director if you think about it, just getting, you know, in that room and seeing audition behind audition. It's hard for them to, and I. I guess that sometimes you walk in and they're like, oh, <laughs> don't yeah. take it personal. They're just tired. They're human beings too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's important to remember that. Yeah, we're actually on the same team. Yeah. That's so cool. I want to go and do something more fun now I, <laughs> because I'm, I'm very nosy and I like to know about like fun stuff. <laughs> Like in your whole career, tell me something really crazy that has happened to you and you're like, whoa, what is this? Something really fun. Oh yeah, a great theater story or yes. like a, a set story, something that happened yeah. on set. Um, let me think. Something let memorable me. that you... I love the story about the twin girls that you get that phone call <laughs> that you've been waiting for and it's like, I'm beating my daughters. And you're like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't drop the child in the tub. Hold on. <laughs> I think that's really fun. I mean, I'm... I, I've had so much, I've had so many, so many experiences that have just been uh, so much fun. I'm, I'm struggling to think of like a, a, a crazy moment right now. I'm blanking on it. Oh, no uh, worries. I'm, I know it's hard to like reach to that, but like anything you, you want to share, something that maybe I mean, I do remember there was a time I was with that company, Driftwood Theater. I remember I was, I was in one scene, I was playing multiple characters, but I think it was we were do- it was King Lear, and it was in Act Five, and everything is happening, uh, like everything is being un- unveiled. And I was a servant; I was somebody's servant, and I was on stage, like, and the and someone is supposed to tell me to go get someone, <laughs> and, and they just forgot the line, and so they never told me to leave. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I was just standing there, and just suddenly leaving. I realized, like, wait, I've. I've never seen this part of the scene before. <laughs> and so I was like listening and I think I started to like sweat and I'm just listening to for like, okay, what line can I possibly use to just go? And eventually I just had to like bolt and just leave. Wow. Let's get out of there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, things like this happen all the time. That's why I love live theater because yeah. you just you've got to be present. You've got to be. It's you never know what's going to happen, and you make it work. Yeah. Um, I remember there was also a time I had this like spinny spinny top on my head. I was playing Dromeo in Comedy of Errors, oh. and and that it like blew off my head somehow. It fell on the floor. <laughs> I love those thingies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and it was there, and I think. You know, you always want, I like, I saw it there and the audience saw it there. And so I picked it up and I ended up doing the rest of my monologue to this little weird twirly thing (laughs) on my head as if it was designed to be that way. Um, And so, yeah. And the audience probably thought that it was designed to be that way. (laughs) Either they did or they they were like, oh, it's great that he's acknowledging what we all just saw happen. And if they're in on the joke, they're going to go along with you and and be there with you. I love that. One thing that happened to me during a play, it it was one of those plays that you produce, you you do everything. And it was for a festival that and my husband, Pablo, who who is also a teacher here here at HB, he was directing and I was producing. So I had to do a lot of stuff stuff that in that morning we only had like that one performance and my character was supposed to be on stage peeling a lettuce and uh, you can tell I don't cook that much because I went and I pick up cabbage 
<laughs> and I was on stage and I was like, this is not like in rehearsal, you know, I was trying to peel it, but it was really hard. <laughs> and, and, and at the end of the show, Pablo comes like, well, what's wrong with that lettuce? Like, what, what's up with that lettuce? And I'm like, I don't know. It was so weird. It was so hard to peel it. Defective. And he's like, this is a cabbage. <laughs> but it was green in my defense. It was green and it looked just like a lettuce, but that, I thought it was really funny. And it's one of those things that happen to you that you're like, why? <laughs> yeah, you always want to be prepared for the unexpected. Yes, and it was in that show that didn't happen to me during rehearsal, but it happened in the one show that we had. So that was really fun. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, yeah, we were, I, I was just looking at a quote from Uta. Well, there's a couple of quotes from Uta that come into my mind as you were talking. The one where um, she says, um, no work of art is ever finished, mm. right? Everything is just constantly moving, living, breathing things, right? Mm. Art is like living and breathing things. And these moments of improv on stage, it's like, that's what happens. You just kind of have to go, go with what's happening. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that expands even into the life of an artist as well, that there is no, there is no end that you get to. There's no place where you're like, oh, now I'm trained. Now I know how to do this. Oh, I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> Never. <laughs> and I, I think there, that sometimes is when you start the training, there, there is a kind of in the back of your mind, a sense of that, like, oh, I, I have to get to a certain point before I'm worthy or before I'm, I, I'm, I'm allowed to do this. But it just never ends. It's a, it never it's a ends. continuous journey. Yeah. Constantly learning. Yeah, and and there's no that I think that I feel like that's a hard thing to impart to students as well. Like there is no there's no done. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's ever done. Even if you, you know, go from acting 1 to acting 2 class, it's like every everything is it, it's just yeah, everything. You just have to keep going. And we as teachers, we keep I mean, I I I I joined a, a company called the Actors Center at where I work I continue to work with with teachers and whether it's that or anything I always want to continue to train because yeah it's I don't want to just rely on what I already know I want to keep on expanding. yeah and then you have more to impart and more to draw from yeah. and we're always learning we're like what like Uta said we're work in progress we're all we're all a work in progress so that's yeah and this is another Uta Hagen one uh, we must overcome the notion that we must be regular it robs you of the chance to be extraordinary mm. and leads you to be mediocre mm. so it's like mm. we were talking about before like limiting ourselves and putting ourselves in a box like that's yeah. a shame because right you that, are extraordinary and if you had allowed yourself to be limited when yes. you had this challenge come upon you when you were a young man 100%. We wouldn't have you as this beautiful artist that you are. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this applies so much to all of us. In, mm. I mean, when I went it, to do this show, this was the, you was the biggest kind of exposure that I would have uh, being on Netflix and being it was like the number one show on Netflix. Yeah, um, we're obsessed. It, <laughs> we're, we're taking a picture, Ben. I want you to know that it's going for my Instagram. <laughs> But when I went out to LA, like the, all of these thoughts and insecurities can come in when, especially when you're entering into some, a, a space that feels new for you. And I was like, you know, I start to think about my body and like my body image, like how should I, uh, should I, should I, should I start working out? Should I start to like <laughs> buff myself up so that people see, you know, I don't know, some kind of better version of myself in some way. And again, it was like, my, I kind of rejected these thoughts as they come up. They still come up, but the best advice that I got, I reached out to it. yet another mentor of mine, David Costable, who's an extraordinary actor. You'll, he's in billions and uh, he's been in a bunch of things. Um, but he was my, he was one of my clown teachers. He taught me Shakespeare's clowns. And I reached out to him to get his advice about going into this show. And he said, just be as Ben Mel as you can be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the best. It's the best. Best advice and, ever. And it's, I mean, so that really was my goal going into this. Like, I just wanted to be okay with who I, more than okay with who I am, but actually celebrate who I am yes. and acknowledge that who I am is what landed me this role and just embrace that fully. Um, yeah, it's it can be pernicious the way these these things can seep into us. I think especially now with with 
there's a lot of pressure, uh, for, especially for young people on social media, to like conform. Yeah. And and it's the last yeah. thing. It's the, the least interesting choice you can make is to be the same as everyone else. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm. I admire you that your brain can reject those things so quickly. <laughs> I feel like my brain will definitely let me tumble Over down pretty that, far yes. when I start to feel like, oh God, what do I look like? I, I don't snap out of it that quickly. You have to teach a workshop on how to like reject the bad thoughts <laughs> immediately, right? It's, um, it's a process, definitely. So yeah. Ben, uh, tell me where can we find you? What classes are you teaching? Is there anything you want to promote and use this space for? I mean, the... I don't always know what's coming up, but I know that in the summer I'll be teaching an improv class here at HB, <gasps> and I would love you to come I'm and join up. us for that. <laughs> I am. Um, and I mean, if you if you want to follow me, you can follow me at Ben Mel on Instagram. I have been following you forever. <laughs> You're stalker for our listeners. <laughs> yeah. And then is you coming back for another season? You it will be continuing. <gasps> yes. Spoiler. So you'll be going back. Well, to, oh my oh, we're God. not sure yet. Oh, we're not allowed to tell us. <laughs> not allowed to tell us. Maybe. I mean, no. I can. I. I feel. I don't know. Just I, uh, blink, <laughs> blink twice if it's no, I'm not, kidding. no. I mean, it's oh, no. This is sort of like not, it's anticlimactic. I. I am. I'm not. I'm not in the next season. I don't know when I will yet. be coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that yeah, in the next I season, but it. I guess I just did. It's fine. So, you can it's just okay. text us. Just text us when you know. No, it gives us an opportunity to write to the producers <laughs> and exactly. for everyone to go. On we want Ben. Use social media. And be like, where's that librarian? We need him. The there. sexy one <laughs> that was walking with a cane. Yes, we want to see him. And Ben, um, tell to our listeners, what's one thing you want people to get from our conversation today? I think be yourself. It's so, it's so cliche, but it's also the hardest thing in the world to do, to allow yourself to do. But to be yourself as fully as you can. I'm crying again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I love another one um, that I was reading another article or an interview with you where you said uh, ad advise students to find their joy, yes. actors to find their joy. <laughs> yes. Assume your brilliance and follow your joy. Yeah. I think that's, it's very important. I think it's easy to, and it's connected to what we were talking about. When you start to try to deliver what you think other people want to see, it starts to disconnect you from your joy and your love that brought you to this in the first place. So trust, trust that because that's what makes you you. That's what makes you unique. Follow your joy in this. Uh, that's so beautiful. And we want to end up with that positive note. We're so excited. This is our <laughs> first episode, guys, of our podcast. That's so exciting. We hope to uh, keep having the opportunity of talking to the students in a closer way and venting and knowing about um, you know, our teacher's career and knowing all about the ups and downs. And, you know, that I feel that always helps in a way we don't feel so alone. We don't feel so lonely in our own yeah. process, in our own search. Yeah. Everyone needs a lot of inspiration on this journey to being an artist or an actor, a teacher, all of the above, because there's so many roadblocks in our, that come along. Yeah, and it's not all on you. It's a, it's there's so much that is out of your control, which is why you got to trust your work and not put your put stock in the result that comes of that because that's that's kind of out of your hands. Exactly. You have something to share, not something to prove. That's Let's right. remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and I like and also always reach out to your mentors yeah. and your fellow artists and your friends who have been with you along the way because they if you can't set yourself straight, they will set you straight in a second. Yes. <laughs> Right. That's amazing. Like, ben, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. It was a pleasure. It's so inspiring talking to you. And yes, it's been amazing. So I will keep tabs on you. Yes, I'll keep following you. I will write you. lots of fan letters. Like a you <laughs> stalker, yeah. Thank you so much, you guys. This was so much fun. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. So, guys, my name is Jesse Hernandez. And I'm Francesca Ferrara. And we want to say goodbye with this beautiful quote that says, keep living, keep going, take the class, make the film, put on the play, you're worth it, you are enough. You know, Uta Hagen was really about rooting yourself into your character. Every moment count. And... Again, thank you, Ben, for joining us. It was and a be pleasure. yourself. Be yourself and follow your joy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
per bed. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I, I feel like I would like to kind of talk uh, more about just the struggle side of it, that it's, that it's, um, you know, my pursuit into finding teaching as a way to keep myself engaged. I think mm-hmm. it's, it's valuable to know that you can, you, you're, you're going to have to find things and connect with your community, um, in order to keep yourself artistically alive. Um, yeah, because it, it's, yeah, there, are, there, are, it's feast and famine with this. There are times where you're going to be too busy and it's, that's going to be stressful. And then there are times where there's going to be nothing and it feels like it can feel like being dropped off the side of the earth and you kind of just disappear and you're like, wait, does anybody even know mm. me out here? Like what's happening? Yeah. And, but of course you are there and you gotta, you gotta keep connecting with people cause it's, it's all people that make this happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so taking class, I think, you know, even when you are, when you are a working actor and also taking a class and just being seen connects you. Um, Mercedes rule, who also teaches here, she used to say that all the time when, when students would ask, how can I get seen? How can I get in here, get there? And she would say, take a class, be on stage anywhere in front of people or in front of a camera in front of people, because if you're taking a class with someone, you, um, they see your work and they might be writing a short film. They might be writing a play or they might be a a friend of mine, Randy from Mercedes class introduced me to his manager who is now my manager. It's like, it's all those connections. Um, like, uh, like you were saying before it's to, it helps keep us alive and move us along Uh, because it is a real struggle and you can go to really dark places when you feel like, Oh God, am I ever going to get anywhere? Yeah. yeah, and creating your own projects, I think it's like really yeah. important to write your own plays or just get together with a group of friends, uh, you know, build your community and start, you know, putting those projects out there. Festivals, there's so many opportunities out there and sometimes you don't have to just wait for somebody to give you an opportunity. I really believe in building a door and opening for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's important too. Yeah, absolutely. Creating your own work, finding people to create with. It's it's easier said than done, but you got to keep on keep on going. Whatever is your interest, I'll expand on what's interesting to you. Yeah, and like you, yeah, like you were saying yeah. before, it's not really even when you do get like you, there's ups and downs. Even when you do have success, there will be times then after that where there's no work. I mean, yes. people like I've heard plenty of um, well-known actors. I think Gene Hackman was definitely one of them. He said every film he ever did thought it was his last one. Yeah. <laughs> right, even when yeah. he was like this big movie star, um, you know, because it's just that volatile. So yeah. you have to keep yourself strong I in remember, between. I remember one of the, one of the early prof- uh, sh- professional theater uh, shows that I did. Mm-hmm. I was working, I was doing Six Degrees of Separation at Williamstown and I... Met, I was talking with the older actors, the more experienced actors, and there was Candy Buckley. I asked her, I was like, so what are you doing after this? And my full expectation was, at this point in your career, you must know exactly yes. you've got something lined up and then <laughs> something lined know? up after that. And I was, I was shocked when she was like, I don't know. I never know. Right. I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how still- this works? <laughs> <laughs> and, and also like Joanna Merlin, who is my teacher at NYU, she's of, of an age of, a, of she's a ex- very experienced actor who has been around for a long time. Brilliant. And I remember seeing her coming back to the school and she had just come from an audition. I was like, wait, you, you still audition? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, that when you have that career, you're like, what? You still have to go and audition? Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, I think crazy. it's valuable to just kind of set these expectations that, yeah. You a constant to, thing. Yeah, exactly. and it's, it's almost like, you know, they were seeing, if you think of the audition as sharing, it's like, oh, just sharing what she would do with that role. It's not like she had to prove something, obviously, because exactly. she was Joanna Merlin, but... Yeah. Did you like working at Williamstown? It's such a beautiful environment. I just went to see a a show there and I was like, I want to live here for the rest of my life. It's so comforting. It's very idyllic. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. small town and artist. I, yeah, I spent I spent a summer there, and I was I was young. It was like the summer after my first year of grad school. Oh, that's um, awesome! And so I met a lot of people, and and I was making connections, and and I remember going out to like like a watering hole and sliding down these like beautiful waterfalls that were nearby, and yeah, it was, it was lovely there. <laughs> yeah, those are the times to hang on to when you're feeling. Like you're losing sight of what you're doing. It's like, oh wait, no. That's right. This is this is fun and it's worth it and it's great and theater heals people, so we have to keep trying to do it no matter what. Yeah. Yes. Right. Especially after yeah. after theater shutting down for so long, coming back and seeing things again, I it was it was very stra- ambulance. <laughs> yeah. Pause for the ambulance, <laughs> everyone. It's funny <laughs> we're talking about the theater being closed for two years and the ambulance and then, goes boom. by. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I think wh- I think the one of the first plays that I that I saw back in person was uh, Birthday Candles on Broadway, and it it was I was just it opened me up so much. I was just crying so much watching that, um, and it reminded me of how important theater genuinely yeah. is yeah. it's to have all of these people together in a space sharing an experience and empathizing with the characters on stage it's something that was really lost when we're all isolated yeah um it is healing yeah, yeah. and zoom was as it was a, a good band-aid but it certainly was not the same as being in person and being with people's energies and spirits and I think it was a band-aid, you know, maybe not a good band-aid. <laughs> no, yeah, not a good band-aid. <laughs> we yeah. got through it somehow, right? Yeah. I mean we find a way. Wow. The show must go on. But yeah. it but it's funny how much we needed it that we were even willing to do theater through Zoom, you know? Exactly. It's yeah. How much the exactly. need was. Yeah. That whatever it takes, we're still creating. Yeah, but and but That's I agree right. with you. Being in theater now, it's it, watching it. It's just it's overwhelming. It's, I did, we missed it so much. Yeah, and I I feel people should always remember because I feel many times artists are not as appreciated as other professions in life. And when we were stuck in the pandemic, everybody relied on Netflix, on music, on reading, and they remembered how important art is in our lives. So I hope that feeling stays with us after the pandemic and, you know, people still, like people who are non-artists still see us and understand how valuable our work is. Yeah. 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 Especially to bring people together yeah. in such divided times. That's, yeah. And to create empathy. Yes. It's so important. And compassion, which mm-hmm. is, can get very lacking in this world mm-hmm. that we're in. Oh, so um, we can find you on the HB Studio website as well for your classes for future. You're yes. doing improvisation in the summer. Yes. But hbstudio.org, um, everyone can go to to always see um, Ben's upcoming classes. And you'll you, always find me teaching in the core. Uh, yes, yay. in the yeah. core. One of my acting one students is auditioning for the core. I'm very excited for next year. Um, so great. Anything else you want to? Um, put out there, share. I mean, maybe people don't. Maybe people don't know about the core training program that yeah. HB offers. It's a it's a full year from September to uh, the, to June, um, where you get movement and voice and speech and acting and acting technique and all of and it. Stage and stage combat, right? To also, yes. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's I think it depends on the covers year. Covers all bases. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I encourage you to look into it if that's if you're looking for a more of a year long thing. Yeah. Uh, wonderful, wonderful teachers. So um, we just want to thank you so much, Ben. This was so wonderful. And Jesse, and um, we'll see you again next time. And Ben, um, someday, maybe on the next one, you'll be our co-host. Awesome. Because I love, it. <laughs> so I love having I'll, you. I'll sit in the corner and just cry for the whole No, thing. no, no, all three beautiful. of us. Is that too many of you? No, all three of us. No, I just want to like listen to you guys because it's been so inspiring. <laughs> I'll just be watching with a, a little napkin crying. Thank you so much, guys. It was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. On to the next. And that's an episode of our HB Insight series. Thank you for listening. Please like and follow us on social media at HB Studio NYC. Subscribe to us on your podcast provider for future episodes. And visit our website at www.hbstudio.org for classes and more information. Until next time.